Father, we, we want to thank you for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for who you are, the way that you care for us. You do provide and protect us. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we, as we look into your word now, we just pray that we would have ears that are open, open to your Holy Spirit and to your leading. For those who are uh, with us this morning, those who are joining with us online later on, um, those who will join with us in, uh, in another service as well. Father, may we each be strengthened and encouraged because of who you are, but because of the way that you speak to us through your word. And so we commit this time to you now. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you'd open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 3. We'll be looking at uh, some verses throughout uh, Joshua chapter 3. I think we've all had times when we've been weak and discouraged. Have you? Felt weak? Felt discouraged? I wonder, are you feeling that way at the moment? Perhaps because of a, a medical diagnosis, be, perhaps because of COVID and the uh, restrictions, the imposition of, of COVID upon us, perhaps the death of a loved one, loneliness, children that are causing you great concern, you're feeling weak, discouraged. Has a trusted friend betrayed you? let you down, having troubles with your studies, feeling weak and discouraged. Turn to God, turn to his word. Let God strengthen you and encourage you through his word. He's in control. He has promised to provide and protect. And he's promised you an eternal home. Trust in his presence, his power and his promises. Trust in his presence, his power, and his promises. The Lord had said to Joshua, I want you to cross over the Jordan and begin to take possession of the promised land. But Joshua, be strong, be courageous. Because there'll be times, Joshua, when you don't feel that way. There'll be times, Joshua, when you won't feel strong and courageous, you'll feel weak, you'll feel discouraged. Trust in me, meditate on my words, there you'll gain your strength to go on. Trust in me and my promises and then you will be strong, you will be courageous. Now imagine yourself as one of the, 40, one of the uh, Hebrew people wandering around in the desert for 40 years. The last 40 years, for some of you, not that old, but imagine wandering around in the desert for 40 years. That had become the new normal for the Hebrew people and that new normal had become the accepted way of life. This was normal, living like nomads in the desert. Forty years we've been doing this. People used to talk about a promised land. Not so much anymore. I wonder if it even exists. I wonder is the promised land even a possibility? Maybe God's promise doesn't apply anymore. Feeling weak and discouraged. With COVID-19 and our current restrictions... Is this like a wilderness period that could go on for years and years and years? Or is it like the crossing of the Jordan River? A short time of transition, but with unknown battles that lay ahead. Either way, are we trusting in God's promises, his power and his presence? And so following the death of Moses, in verse 10, Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go throughout the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you're going to cross the Jordan 
here and go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving as your own. It's now time to cross the border. The border is no longer closed. And the Hebrew people, this may have been exciting, but it might have also heightened their levels of anxiety as they faced the unknown. Joshua gave the people three days to prepare to cross the Jordan and then the day before they were to cross, he'd given specific instructions for the people to consecrate themselves. Verse 5, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I believe there's a lesson here for us. If we want God to do amazing things in our lives, in our world, then we must stand before him in purity. We need to set ourselves apart, to consecrate ourselves, set ourselves apart from the ways of the world. Seek God in humility, confess our sin, seek his forgiveness, consecrate ourselves. It was a reminder to the Hebrew people that they need to be right before the Lord as much as do the leadership of the Hebrew people. The people are responsible for themselves if they're to see the blessing from the hand of God. We too are responsible for ourselves when it comes to being under the blessings of the Lord and seeing him at work in amazing ways in our lives. But if you're in cruise control, hoping that the leadership of the church will ensure that you come under God's blessing, think again. If you're in cruise control, hoping that your parents' righteousness will prevent you from going through tough times, think again. Consecrate yourselves that you may then see the miraculous hand of God in your life personally. Consecrate yourself. Now we know that at the moment that we commit ourselves to following Jesus, that we follow him as our Lord and our Saviour, then we are declared righteous. And we're forgiven of our sin, but we still sin. We don't live without sin. We fail. We fall. And thus we need to continue to seek the Lord and his forgiveness and consecrate ourselves to living faithfully for him. Joshua said, purify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. The same is true today. If we purify ourselves, God may choose to do great wonders in our lives. But he's already done the greatest of wonders. Standing as pure before the Lord is a great wonder. Sinners as we are, yet standing as righteous before our holy God. That is wondrous and wonderful. Praise God. So in a moment we're going to share in communion. Grateful for our salvation, but also seeking to examine ourselves and recommitting ourselves to living faithfully for our Lord. From 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. I invite you to take the bread right now, just to, to pick that up. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul then wrote, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so before we eat, I invite you to examine yourself. We invite the Holy Spirit to speak into our minds, to our hearts, to reveal to us the areas where we need to confess our sin, where we need to consecrate ourselves to being faithful servants of his. So let's just take a moment, invite the Holy Spirit to, to help you to examine yourself. Father, we thank you that Jesus said as he broke that bread, this is my body. This bread represents what I'm about to do for you, for his disciples, for us. We thank you that Jesus' body was broken, was torn apart in many respects, but Father, we thank you for the, the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to make so that we might have life in all of its fullness. We might know forgiveness. And Lord, we, we do ask for forgiveness for our sin. And we thank you for that forgiveness that you grant us. So Lord, as we take this bread now, we do so in gratitude and in remembrance the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We thank you. Amen. Let's eat together. After the supper, after the Passover meal, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. A new covenant. We praise God for the new covenant. In Jesus' blood, we are forgiven. As we take this, this juice right now, it represents Jesus' blood and that covenant written between God and us. Let's drink in remembrance and praise. And so as instructed... For Joshua, the ark of the Lord was carried by the priest toward the Jordan River. And the Jordan River at this particular time happens to be in flood. Jordan River, it's not a big river. On average, 10 to 15 metres across. But it's in flood. And so it's both wider and more treacherous than usual. If you'd have crossed the Jordan River, then it wouldn't be now. It wouldn't be when it's in flood. But this is when Joshua and the people are instructed. In chapter 3, we're told why the Lord instructs Joshua the way that he does. 
verses 9 to 13. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites and Jebusites. See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. As soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. It's twice in these verses that God says that he is the God of all of the earth. So for the Hebrew people, for Joshua, they're being reminded, God is the God of Egypt, where you were slaves. God is the God of Egypt, where you were rescued. God is the God of the land of the Canaanites, into which you were about to travel. God is the Lord of all the earth. God is the God of the Red Sea and is the God of the Jordan River. And you'll know that he's the living God by the, him providing you access, crossing the Jordan. You'll know that you can trust him to drive out those who presently occupy the land. God is first. He's the God of all of the earth. And so he's the God of whatever you're facing. He's the God over coronavirus. Are you trusting in the living God as you face the unknown, as you face your battles, as you step into a place that may bring fear and insecurity, that may cause you to feel weak and discouraged? He's the living God, he's the God of all the earth. According to verses 15 and 16, the place where the waters were stopped was some 30 kilometres upstream. 30 kilometres upstream. This means that the waters at their point of crossing would slowly go down. Slowly begin to drop to the point where they could cross over on dry ground. I think we can safely assume that the priests stood in that river for quite some time before they saw anything happening. And the people stood on the banks of the river watching this somewhat dangerous activity, holding this Ark of the Covenant in flooding waters, without seeing anything happening for quite a while. I think you can... Picture that. Joshua had said, the river will stop. And we believe you, Joshua, but so far, um, nothing's happening. More often than not, I think this is the way that miracles happen in our lives. The miracle of your salvation, the miracle of your transformation, takes time. For many miracles, we have to wait. We have to stand in the water. We have to fight the current, believing in the promise. And then we might see the miracle. And maybe God does it to test our faith. Maybe he does it to prove his faithfulness and his presence prior to the miracle. Maybe he does it to teach us how strong we need to be in the current to trust him. Maybe he does it just because he works on a different agenda than we do. But for whatever reason, he always comes through. If God has promised and God has given you direction, then trust him. He will come through. And so the Hebrew people... 
they eventually see the hand of God at work and they're reminded that God is leading them and that the God of Joshua is the same God as the God of Moses and both Moses and Joshua lead the people through waters on dry ground. Chapter 4, verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we'd crossed over. Hebrew people, you can trust Joshua just as we could trust Moses. The Lord dried up the Jordan as the Lord went before his people. And both the priests and the people had to trust God. Imagine being one of the priests. Go on, step into that river while it's in full flood. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, looking forward to that. And when the people are crossing over, oh, I hope the floodwaters don't suddenly come crashing through. Trusting God when it doesn't make sense? We can because God goes before his people. God goes before. Chapter 3, verse 3 tells us that Joshua instructed the people to follow the Ark of the Covenant and then in verse 4 that the Lord would lead the way because they'd never been this way before. Verse 3, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you'll know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 1,000 yards between you and the Ark. Don't go near it. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God with his people. And the distance between them was to remind them of God and his holiness. The distance between them. That they should have a healthy fear of God, not to become too presumptuous before him. But I also imagine the Ark of the Covenant being upstream from where they're crossing over. And if they happen to shoot a nervous glance upstream to see if the waters are surging down, the waters are coming, what would they see? But the ark, the ark of the covenant, standing there, standing between them and the threat of a mighty pile of water. The distance was a sign of respect and evidence of the holiness of God, but also of his protection over them. It's the ark. It's God protecting us. God goes before us. He provides for us. He protects us. And so if you stand on the edge at the moment, you're facing an obstacle, are you prepared to take the first step into that obstacle to trust God, just as the priests had to. God comes first, goes first, is first. And as you cross the river of your circumstances, are you filled with fear and insecurity, feeling weak and discouraged? As we wade through the river of COVID-19, it's easy to be struck with fear and insecurity. We don't really know what lies on the other side. We believe it will be good and we believe that God is there. He'll be with us. But as we move on, are we being challenged to trust God? The familiar life might well be behind us. And we hope for a good life, but we don't know what difficulties we're going to face, what battles we'll have to fight, what enemies will attack us. 
We don't know what tomorrow holds, what, it'll, what it looks like, how long it will take to cross the river. So when we find ourselves in unfamiliar territory, tinged with fear and insecurity, feeling weak and discouraged, we should look to God's familiar presence, power and promises. In uncertain times, we should trust in the certainty of our God. He comes first, goes first, is first. He's the God of all the earth. He is your God and mine. Amen.